Last week, the lesson was, it's when we are weak that we discover God's strength. This week's lesson is the end result of our faith in God and love for his people. What's the end result of that when we have faith in God and love for his people? That's what we're going to talk about. But first, um, you know, last uh, week we talked about, if you remember, chapters and verses being added. In the 1200s, chapters being added to the Bible. And then in the 1500s, verses being added. Uh, up till then, there was none. But, you know, Michael at work, a guy I break with, or with the Jason, were you the one that said maybe they had page numbers? No, Michael at work. Uh, so maybe it wasn't totally impossible to find your way around. Maybe they numbered the pages. So you could say, turn to page number 742, uh, paragraph 2 or whatever. Maybe there was some way. But thank God for chapters and verses. But the reason we brought that up last week is because the last two verses of chapter 2 and the first few verses of chapter 3 are a continuing thought. They sh there shouldn't be a chapter division there. It makes you think that one subject is ended and another started, and that's not the way it is. Remember, the words are inspired. The chapters and verses were added by people to help us find a way around the Scripture. They're not inspired, all right? But they sure do help us out. Thank God for that. So, the last uh, two verses of chapter 2 was for what is our hope our joy our crown of rejoicing and, and and instead of reading all that verse 20 for you are our glory and joy so he's telling the believers in Thessalonica how much he loves them and longs to see them again verse 1 then as you can see of chapter 3 is the continuation wherefore when we could no longer forbear we thought it would be good to be left in Athens alone in, in verse 2 and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and comfort you concerning the faith. So, uh, in essence, he's saying, we miss you guys, and I can't stand not knowing how you're doing any longer. So, I sent Timothy away from me. He's part of the ministry. He's a right-hand guy. I need him. But I chose not to keep him here, to send him there, because I had to know. Um, and he wanted to make sure they were still standing in the faith, and um, uh, told them that he had told them when he was there that Christians are going to suffer persecution. And uh, again, in verse 5, verse 2 said he sent Timothy to strengthen you, comfort you concerning your faith. Verse 5, For this cause I could no longer forbear. I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. So he said, the real reason I, there are two reasons I sent Timothy. One is to strengthen you. But the real nagging reason why I sent him is I can't stand not knowing about you anymore. I want to know how you're doing. So that was last week. There's only 13 verses in this chapter. We covered five last week, and we're going to cover the other eight this week. So we're going to get through this chapter pretty quick. But on the other hand, there's no break there. I mean, you, these verses belong together, so uh, verses 6 through 13. So we're going to cover them all tonight, all right? This week's lesson, the end result of our faith in love, our faith in God and love for his people. Uh, so in other words, what we're going to learn in this lesson, when we have faith in God and love His people, what's the end result of that? How does that benefit us? All right, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to start with verse 6. He sent Timothy last week. The first verse this week is about Timothy coming back from Thessalonica. So he said, But now when Tim Timotheus came from you unto us, and brought us good tidings of your faith in charity, and that you have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. So the Good News Bible there rendering is, Now Timothy has come back, and he has brought us the welcome news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always think well of us, and that you want to see us just as much as we want to see you. So what kind of news did Timothy bring to Paul? Uh, the Greek word 
for where it said brought us good tidings the Greek word for good tidings there is strong number 2097 in the New Testament according to Sayers Greek dictionary it's used especially the glad tidings of the coming kingdom of God and of the salvation to be attained in it through Christ and of what relates to that salvation so I have a program, and a, Bible, a Bible program that I don't use a lot, but I use it for stuff like this. I can go into the online Bible study. That's the name of the program, online Bible study. And where I search for a verse, if instead of typing in a verse, instead of typing in John 3.16, I can type in a Greek number. And it'll pull up all the verses in the New Testament, because, of course, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Uh, so it'll, it'll pull up all the verses with that Greek word in it. And so I can see, then, how that word was rendered in the translations that way. All right, so I have that information right underneath there. Um, it was used 55 times in the New Testament this word that is rendered good tidings, brought us good tidings. 23 of those times, it's rendered preach. 22, preach the gospel. Two, bring good tidings. Two more, show glad tidings. Bring glad tidings uh, uh, one time, declare glad tidings one time, miscellaneous three. So, 51 out of 55 times this word is used in the King James Bible, it refers to the gospel. This would be the one miscellaneous time in our lesson. Said so there are three miscellaneous, this would be one of them. So when it says that Timothy came back and brought us, in essence, the gospel, well, what it really means, you know, the gospel means good news. That's what the word gospel means. If I'm preaching you the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm teaching you the good news about Jesus. That's what gospel means, it's good news. The way some people preach it, you'd never know it meant good news. <laughs> but that's what it means, is good news. How many of you know we can use some good news? Especially the kind of good news that affects our eternity. So they use that same Greek word, Timothy only this time it just simply means good news. Timothy brought back, after he went to Thessalonica, he came back with good news. So it's, it's kind of funny because they use that powerful word that in essence means sharing the gospel. It's a word that means evangelize, specifically. Uh, it's a Greek word that ties into, uh, in the Latin to... Um, evangelized. So he's, uh, in essence, he's evangelizing Paul. He says, I'm bringing you good news going to cheer you up. Uh, in this case, it's not the gospel, but it's about the gospel. Because why did he send Timothy there? To find out how the converts were doing in the faith. They sowed among them seeds of the gospel. Paul is dying to know How's it doing? Is there a crop? They gave, at the very minimum, mental assent when we were there, but then persecution uh, separated us. So, and I haven't seen them since. So did it really take? And Timothy comes back excited and said, it took. So he, he brings Paul good news about, again, verse 6, about two things specifically brought us good tidings, or brought us the gospel, brought us good tidings of your faith and charity. And remember, the King James word charity doesn't mean given to the Jerry Lewis telethon. It means love. It's the uh, Greek word agape, and it means uh, godly love for one another. And God's love for us and our love for God and our love for one another uh, is often from the Greek word agape. And that's the word there. So, and besides the fact that they were doing good in faith and good in charity or good in love, uh, they also obviously remembered Paul and his crew well because they're the ones that brought them the gospel. 
that they are now living out. So they had fond memories of Paul and Paul saying just the way uh, uh, desiring greatly to see us and we also to see you. Now, what does verse, uh, else does verse 6 tell us there? That phrase where it said, they had good remembrance of us always desiring greatly to see us, desiring greatly. I found the Greek word there, 1971. Our daughter was two years old in 1970. Oh, that's not what it means. It means the Greek word 1971. It means to long for, desire. It means to pursue with love, to long after. It means to lust, harbor forbidden desire. And the reason I put that information in here, the Philippian believers had this kind of longing to see Paul and his team again. They longed for it. The desire, the good desire, remember the word lust in the Bible is a generic word. In other words, it simply means desire. It can be desire something good or desire something bad. In the New Testament, usually it's used in the latter, desiring something bad when we think of the word lust. Except when it says, uh, the flesh lust is against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. When it's talking about the Holy Spirit, it's just talking about a great desire. Uh, when it's talking about mankind, it usually refers uh, to something bad, but not here. I put that definition down so to draw a picture for you how desperately longing they were to see Paul and his team again. And Paul said, and that's the way we are towards you in his letter. So you have the two sides each with a desperate desire to see one another again. All right? Now, verse 7. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our afflictions and distress by your faith. Easy to read version adds a new light to that. So, brothers and sisters, we are encouraged about you because of your faith. We have much trouble and suffering, but still we are encouraged. In other words, you know, everywhere Paul went, there was suffering. All you have to do again is read First Corinthians chapter or Second Corinthians chapter eleven. Seems to me to have been his thorn in the flesh. There was Satan assigned a particular demon, in my mind, a messenger of Satan to buffet him. The Scripture says, assigned a special demon to follow Paul around everywhere he went, and to stir up folk to do him harm because the demon himself could not touch him. He's a child of Almighty God. But he could sure stir up trouble for him. And he did. And uh, so, what it's saying here, in spite of all the trouble we have, how many of you, no matter how much you love God, if every town you went to, if you're a traveling evangelist, and every town you went to, you got beat up, run for your life, stoned, you traveled to the next town, got held up by robbers along the way, took a ship somewhere and ended up hanging onto a board for a day and a night, get arrested by a city and beaten with rods five times, 39 stripes by a whip three times. How many of you know there comes a time when you say, Lord, let it stop. I haven't endured any of that. And I've said a few times, Lord, let it stop. What? What do you want to stop? I want better gas mileage in my car, Lord. I mean, we got serious problems, don't we? Uh, Paul faced horrible, horrible situations. And he said, but in spite of all that we go through, hearing how you were doing, encourage us. And you know, I thought of that. Flip the page over if you would. Before I make that comment I was going to go into, let's add verse 8 to it. This is a strange verse. Let me read verse 7 again and then verse 8. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live 
if you stand fast in the Lord. That's kind of an odd verse in the King James. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. So I put some other renderings of that verse there. The contemporary English version. Your strong faith in the Lord, I love this. Your strong faith in the Lord is like a breath of new life. Easy to read version. Our life is really full if you stand strong in the Lord. God's word translation. Now we can go on living as long as you keep your relationship with the Lord firm. New living translation. It gives us new life knowing you remain strong in the Lord. The living Bible. We can bear anything as long as we know that you remain strong in the Lord. So it's not talking about now we live. Uh, the way you and I think of live. I mean, of course they're still alive. They were alive when they didn't know, and they were alive after they found out they're doing well. But the idea, I, I love the first one, the contemporary English version. Hearing how you, you're doing in Christ was like a breath of new life. Huh? You ever go outside on a sunny day with a warm breeze or a cool breeze on a hot day? And there's just something exhilarating about it. That seems to be the picture here. Sometimes the great man of God, Paul, who one could argue that if you take Jesus out of the equation, if you take the God man out, Paul might have been the greatest man of God we've ever seen. Uh, God makes those calls, but you could almost, just from reading the Bible, you could, you could make that argument. This great man of God got weary with suffering. Nobody likes pain. I personally want to go on record as telling you I hate pain. But yet I hang around Lynn. But <laughs> he is like a breath of new life to me. Did you ever know that? No. <laughs> like a breath of new life to me. So, what seems to be the thought process of Paul here? The Thessalonian, going back over the previous verses, the Thessalonian believers were a source of great joy for the evangelist, chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. Therefore, he said, we miss you immeasurably. That's my word, but that's in essence what he was saying. Chapter 3, verse 1. We had to send Timothy to find out what's going on with you because we can't stand not knowing. Chapter 3, verse 2, and verse 5. We rejoiced when Timothy brought such good news to us about your faith. Chapter 3, verse 6. Knowing you are standing strong in the faith brought comfort to us through our trials. Chapter 3, verse 7. And the great news was like a breath of new life to us. Verse 8 of chapter 3. Now, I put a note here that I really want you to, you to consider. Make no mistake about it. When you are strong in your faith in the Lord, it is an encouragement to your fellow Christians. You don't have to be Paul to be encouraged about like that, stuff like that. When you set aside your faith and save it for another day, it is discouraging to other believers. None of us live on an island. We all live and breathe what the other one does. So when you look at someone that's doing well, someone you care about, someone among your numbers, among your family, whatever might be the deal, and you know of what faith they've had in the past, like Paul knew about their faith, and you see them now excelling in the faith, that's an encouragement to you. Without a question. They don't have to be direct family, just spiritual family. It's encouraging. When you see people that are kind of in halfway, it's discouraging. You want them to jump in all the way. You don't want them to straddle the fence. And I'm not just talking about the building here. The building is just a representation of where you're at with God. If you only go to church on a rare occasion, then you're not real hot in your relationship with God. 
just the fact. The Bible tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Uh, it tells us rather to encourage one another um, to keep, uh, as Paul put it, to keep us strong in the faith. So, point I'm getting at is, yeah, this is way back then. Paul discouraged in the midst of, you know, when you're going through horrible stuff, how many of you know it, it affects how you think about everything? You just, you know, it's an, a, it, it's an annoyance that makes you look, almost miss your blessings. You're so concentrated on what's happening. You almost miss the blessings in your life. And uh, then all of a sudden, somebody brings you really good news about someone you care deeply about. Paul said, man, it was like a breath of new life. Or as we'd say it in today's language, a breath of fresh air. Just made me feel so good. And I just wanted to point out from this verse before we go on, you have that effect on others. We don't live on an island alone. It matters to me how you're living the faith. And it matters to others how you're living the faith. And it matters to you how people you care about are living the faith. If you're passionate about Christ, you want everyone you love to be passionate about Christ. Not just physical family, everybody. Especially if they were passionate about Christ at some time in their past. So much in the world can cool us off. There's just so many things in the world that can cool us off. And so that's why we need to encourage one another daily, the Scripture teaches. All right, now let's go to verse 9. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we, uh, we joy for your sake before our God? So again, the contemporary, I mean, the uh, yeah, contemporary English version, how can we possibly thank God enough for all the happiness you brought it? Easy to read. Uh, we have so much joy before our God because of you. So we thank God for you, but we cannot thank him enough for all the joy we feel. Verse 10, night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your faith and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. So he's ever the evangelist. Make no mistake about it. Every preacher in America and around the world, every gospel preacher, thinks he has something to share with others that will strengthen their faith. And not just preachers, a Kevin Fleming, who's not what you'd call a preacher. He teaches for rich sometimes when he's out of town. But he always feels like he has something to encourage someone in the faith. Many of you, Sometimes when you see someone discouraged, you wish you could get them aside because you think you have something to share with them to encourage them in the faith. Well, the advantage Paul had over the rest of us, he was a writer of Scripture. He knew he had things to share that would strengthen their faith. So he is absolutely delighted at Timothy's report that they're doing great. But he's a perfectionist. He doesn't want great, he wants fantastic. So he said, I'm just longing to see you, praying night and day that God will make a way so we can see you, number one, and number two, strengthen your faith in areas where it's lacking. How many of you know none of us are perfect? We all lack. And so that's why we need to encourage one another daily. All right, now verse 11. After saying night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your faith, our faith, verse 11, now God himself and our Father, in other words, Jehovah God our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ will prepare the way for us to come to you. So Paul prayers, after he was delighted with the good news from uh, Timothy, it made him want to see him even more. He was already desperate to see him. He was already agonizing that he didn't know how they were doing. 
now that he knew how they were doing, it lit the fire even more. He said, I'm praying day and night that God will prepare a way for us. So I'm going to talk about that preparing a way for a minute. Earlier in this, in this epistle, 1 Thessalonians 2.18 in the last chapter, he said, Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. So when he's praying now that he is delighted to hear how well they're doing in the faith, he's saying, Lord, prepare us a way. Prepare us a way. Where we thought was a way before, Satan blocked it. We wanted to be there, Satan hindered it. So now he's talking to the big guy. Sometimes Satan gets the upper hand on us. And I don't mean in the sense of making a sin or anything like that. We seem to do all right that way all by ourselves. But sometimes when we think there's a place we need to be, the devil hinders. And now Paul's fire has been lit. I, I want you to get this. I can't stress this enough because we're leading that way in closing. I can't stress this enough. He was anxious to see them. So much so that Timothy was a fellow worker of his. He loved having Timothy by his side. He seen Timothy as his spiritual son. Meaning he evidently had led Timothy to faith in Christ. Even though Timothy had a godly mother. Um, he either led him to Christ or burst a, um, a spiritual maturity in his life and he uh, sometimes he would call Timothy my son he seen Timothy as a spiritual son of his he didn't want Timothy anywhere but right next to him but he's saying I want to see you so bad know how you're doing I can't stand it anymore so I'm going to stay here alone he wasn't all alone but he was alone without Timothy and he sent Timothy to find out how they were doing. Desperate to see him. Now he gets wonderful news. You think that would be one of these days. He wanted to make sure they hadn't shipwrecked their faith. They hadn't. They were doing fantastic. Should have been. It was a breath of fresh air or a breath of life, a new breath of life to him. But instead of taking a, a break there a little bit, it lit a fire. He wanted to see him even more, even more. And we're going to get into that here. So hearing they were doing well didn't lessen the desire to see them. It increased it. All right? Now, so he's asking... Uh, wanted God to walk them right through the hindrance of the devil so they could successfully return to Thessalonica. Verse 12. And the Lord make you, now this is where we're getting into what we started with with our title here. What is the end result of our faith in God and love for his people? Look at verse 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound and love one toward another. In other words, well, we'll get to that in a minute uh, in the easy-to-read version. The Lord make you to increase, abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. So the easy-to-read version, Re we pray that the Lord will make your love grow. We pray that he will give you more and more love for each other and for all people. We pray that you will love everyone the same way we love you. In essence, he's saying, church, love your fellow Christian. And then he adds a caveat, and everyone. Love your fellow Christians, love each other. And all people is the caveat, everyone else. So we're not just instructed to love fellow believers, we're instructed to love all men, but 
he emphasizes the loving fellow believers. And why is that? Well, you hear me talk about it all the time in the night he was betrayed. A new command give I unto you that you love one another even as I have loved you in John 13, 34, 35. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples and, you have, and that you have loved one for the other. So Jesus is saying in this church age, what shows your genuineness of faith is when you love fellow believers. The world is not impressed by your dedication and abstinence. We get impressed by our dedication and abstinence. But it doesn't impress the world. Most of the world is living on the brink, giving up, I don't know, the brink of thinking nobody cares about me. All of us have one thing in common. We want to know that somebody gives a hoot. And so when the world is looking into the, from the outside into the Christian community, Jesus said the only way they're going to know how genuine you are is when they see you loving each other. It is the hallmark of evangelism. Our words are empty if we're not loving each other. And so Paul said, I pray that you'll increase in love for each other. And then for everybody. And why does he separate it? Why doesn't he just say for everybody? Because loving people outside of the church is a different subject. God so loved the world, we should so love the world, right? But the number one key for the church in evangelism is people need to know that we love each other. If we're, Paul said to the Galatians, if you're biting and devouring one another, be careful you'll be consumed. If the world looks into the church, and they don't separate it by um, crossroads and refuge and walk of great, they don't separate it, it's all the church to them. So if they look into the church community and they see people at Walk of Grace putting people down at Crossroads and people at Crossroads putting people down at Refuge, they're not impressed. They're not impressed. This is such simple stuff and we always overlook it. We think if we build a bigger building, we think if we um, preach a better sermon, buy a better suit of clothes, pay higher dollar for the next haircut, that sooner or later we will impress somebody. But the only kind of impressing anybody that matters Jesus. to God is you and I loving each other. All right? So, in verse 12, he's saying, the Lord make you to increase and abound in love toward one another. Now remember, he's already said up here, um, on the previous side, that Timothy brought good news uh, about their faith and charity. So, said Timothy told us that you got faith in God and you love the folk. Now he's saying that's wonderful. Let's get that fire burning hotter. Let's get it stoked up a little. So he said, the news was so great, it was a breath of fresh air to Paul. It made Paul look past his persecutions and find joy. That's how great the news was. And then he felt the joy and said, all right, on with the battle. We got to increase your faith and increase your love. No time for a holiday. We're rejoicing in what God's doing for your life, but we want to get there so we can help God do even more in your life. All right? So he says... The Lord make you to increase and abound in love toward one another. All right, now verse 13. To the end. The beginning of verse 13. The end result of our faith in God and love for his people. That's why I put the end result in the title. To the end. So he said, we, we receive the good news that you have faith in God and love each other. Now I want to get there and help you in the area that's lacking in your faith. And I'm praying that God will increase your love. He was excited about their faith and love. 
said, I want to come and strengthen your faith even more. I'm praying God will turn up the fire on your love. Paul, in the first chapter of some of his epistles, would write to the various churches, since I heard of your faith and love, I have not ceased praying for you. And again, you've heard me talk. Jack's been around me forever. I think uh, Abraham Lincoln was president when Jack and I met. And um, he's heard me say this a lot. We, in the bulletin here, when we have prayer requests, isn't that a pretty bulletin? Uh, when we have prayer, <laughs> I wish I could afford color every week. But anyway, on with the subject. When we have prayer requests, you know who we put in there? People that have physical needs or discouraged about something. Uh, people who need us all to care about them, pray for them. And Paul prayed for those folk too. But you know who made his everyday prayer list? The ones who were full of faith and love. Now why is that? What do you, as soon as he found out about their faith and love, here he is praying for them. Why? Because people full of faith and love have potential spiritually. We all have potential to make spiritual noise. Every one of us do. But when we love God with all the heart and love his people, Paul sent <coughs> spiritual possibilities. So he put them above the sick uncle in his prayer list. He put them above the discouraged aunt. He said, I never cease to pray for you because of your faith and love. Now we're going to see a little bit why in closing here. But I want you to see this. If you had lived in that day and wanted to get Paul's fire burning brighter, let him see faith and love in you. He's going to sit you down and try to build your faith up even more. And he's going to pray, my God, increase the love. Just, it's undeniable to me when you study Paul. Those were the two things he looked for in people that lit his fire. God, there's such potential there. All right, so he says in verse 12, I'm asking the Lord in verse 11 and 12, I'm asking God not only to make a way for us to get there, but to make you increase and abound in love toward one another. In verse 13, to the end he may establish your hearts on blamable and holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all saints. The Good News Bible. In this way he will strengthen you, and you will be perfect and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all who belong to him. Again, 1 Thessalonians, staying with this particular letter, Chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, We give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love. Faith and love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ and the Son of God our Father. Uh, verse 6 of chapter 3, the one we're in now, When T Timotheus came from uh, you unto us and brought us the good tidings of your faith and charity, faith and love, without ceasing, uh, I mean... Uh, uh, jump to the other verse. Uh, good tidings of your faith and charity and how you want to see us the way we want to see you. So Paul says at the beginning of this e epistle, verses 2 and 3 of the first chapter, because I've heard of your faith and love, even though I haven't been there since you got saved, I was there to help lead you to Christ and in persecution run me out of town. Haven't seen you since, but man, is your faith spread. And since I heard of your faith and your love, I haven't quit praying for you. Here at the end of chapter 3, he's saying, I'm praying God will prepare a way for us to get there because I want to add more to your faith. And I'm praying God will light up your fire even hotter. Thank you. Why? Because this is the perfection that God is looking for in us. You're going to heaven if you're saved. 
Amen. We think perfection is dedication and abstinence. We always get caught up on that. We make dedication and abstinence. I've been preaching this stuff for years. And I still judge myself by dedication and abstinence. As Martin Luther said, legal, uh, legalism is bound up in the heart of a man and it's hard to drag it out of it. You preach and 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 you preach. And the next thing, you find yourself on the floor thinking, my goodness, I lack faith. I mean, I lack dedication and abstinence. On the other hand, if we pursue faith and love, dedication and abstinence happen without our pursuing them they become a byproduct of what we're really pursuing. Faith in God and love for his people. When we pursue that passionately, we start setting aside things that are hindering us. That's abstinence. Starting, we start picking up things that aid that. That's a dedication. Amen? So, before we end this all together, Oh, I had another verse I wanted to... Lord, forgive me for being old. <laughs> had a verse there. No, oh, I really wanted to end with it. Uh, faith in love. Oh, here it is. 1 John chapter 3. I didn't have it on my sheet, so I'm going to turn to it in here. 1 chapter, First John chapter 3. Let's start with verse 16. You know love by this, that he weighed down his life for us. And we ought to weigh down our lives for the brethren. But whoso has this world's good, and behold his brother in need, and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in, excuse me, deed in truth. We shall know by this that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Now listen. In whatever our heart condemns us, in whatever our heart condemns us, we're going to assure our heart before him when we love folk, in whatever area our heart condemns us. For God is greater than our heart. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Now listen, whatsoever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments. And do the things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that you believe in the name of the, his son Jesus Christ, faith, and love one another, just as he commanded us. What does John tell us it's all about? He said, you want your prayers answered? Keep his commandments. The minute some people read that, they can, all they can see is Moses' Ten Commandments. That's all they can see. John goes on and explains what he means. This is the commandment of God. has two parts to it. So in one place he used pearl, and in the next place he used singular. Keep his commandments, for this is his commandment. Believe on Jesus. There's faith. Love each other. There's love. He said if we're doing these two things, we're keeping God's commandments. And because of that, we have confidence to pray and God will give us whatever we ask. So again here, what's he saying at the end of uh, chapter 3 in our study? He's saying, I want God to increase you in love. i am already rejoiced over your faith. I've already told you I want to get there and increase your faith even more. And I'm praying that God will help you burn brighter in your love. That you'll love um, all those around you in the church and that you'll love people outside the church. For this reason, here's the end game. As the Good News Bible puts it, 
You will be perfect and holy in the presence of our God and Father when the Lord Jesus comes with all who belong to him. Paul is consistent throughout his writings. Spiritual maturity produces dedication and abstinence. Dedication and abstinence does not produce spiritual maturity. Many times it produces spiritual arrogance. I pray more than you. Nah, 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 nah. I read the Bible more than you. Nah, 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 nah. When you pursue dedication and abstinence, it produces the wrong thing in you. When you want to do what God wants you to do more than anything else, trust His Son and love each other. When that becomes your pursuit, Paul said, you're going to have a, hood, a good homecoming when Jesus comes. Amen. Now, don't get me wrong. You're going to heaven. That's going to be a good homecoming anyway. But he said, here's how to make it really great. Get right in those two areas.